Thank you so much. Good to be with you again for anybody that was here last hour. Uh, this hour, I'm delighted that my wonderful wife, Becky, is right here in the front row. With, without her, our three children would not have grown up as finely adjusted and well-balanced and serving God the way they do. And now all three kids are married with... Uh, lovely spouses. They're all serving God. Our five grandkids are all serving God. And our... All right. Let's have heritage, right? Heritage is good. And uh, our, our second grandson got married in June. And so uh, we're ready for the next generation. Although I don't think I'm quite old enough to have grandkids yet. So anyway, that's, that's another... <laughs> no, not even grands. I feel younger than that. You're just trying to correct me and get me up to where I am. I know I'm, I know I'm old. I, I look old on the outside. I feel young on the inside. So what can I say? <laughs> but anyway, it's been a, a great delight to um, be able to partner with Sunrise Christian Center and Pastor Dan and Terry. We've obviously followed their story uh, from the beginning and uh, worked together. When Pastor Dan was first starting out, and we put him on staff, uh, he's, he's right, he, was, he struggled preaching a little bit, but he was an incredible evangelist. And uh, I remember one time asking him, Dan, how is it that you're able to lead Christ, people to Christ so, so well? And he said, I have no idea. He said, I just tell them till they understand. I thought, <laughs> there you go. You just tell them till they understand. And uh, many of you are here because he told you till you understood. Came to know what it means to know Jesus Christ as your Lord, your Savior, your King. And you became part of this body and you're growing in His grace. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But right now, let me just uh, shoot up a, a quick PowerPoint. I want to just talk about our fellowship. Uh, the fellowship goes back to the 20s, but uh, just a few statistics. We're not a huge group. There's 89 churches that are part of it right now, but at the weekend it tends to be about 20,000. We've got numbers of large churches, and we've got small churches. We've got little country churches and big city churches. 2017, we've planted four new churches, Arizona, Idaho, New York, and uh, we have about 428 listed pastors or ministers right now. 94 of them are missionaries, so about 25% of our, our listed group of ministries are missionaries. Canada has a similar number, and then we developed a few years ago, started trying to identify who's really connected and what has God done through this fellowship and through all these missionaries. And we recognize, obviously, partnership with Canada, their Fellowship of Christian Assemblies Canada. Our website, fcaministers.com, is the same for both sides. But Liberia has been going on since the 20s, and uh, uh, they have now the Fellowship of Christian Assemblies in Liberia. We have Nigeria, we have Zambia, we have uh, uh, Kenya and now Ivory Coast. This is one of the first churches that started last year in January. This is Power and Love Church, Queen Creek, Arizona. I'll get it all together. It's only the second time through it. I'll have it by the third time. Come back next hour, we'll have it perfect. <laughs> Queen Creek, they started in 2017, and there are uh, about 65 there regularly. They meet in the basement of their home, big house that God gave them, and Chris and... Uh, Leah Newton are doing that church, planted out of Two Rivers, which Fellowship planted with Tom Alexander in 2004. I think he's probably been here and spoken. Uh, you know Tom. This is Joe Soria. Joe and Joy are moved from Wisconsin. They're in the northwest corner of Phoenix in the Peoria area. Started a Rise Church uh, just a year ago. They're now public. But they started with the Alpha Course in a small uh, meeting space in the apartment complex they live in, and God is starting to help them to develop. So. The uh, Boise, Idaho, we're trying to get a church started there. Uh, Bacon, Bonnick, and Ty were with us in uh, Rockford for 25 years, and now they moved to Boise, fastest growing city in the U.S. But uh, even though it's got, uh, above it, it's, it's got the cross, only 7% of the people attend church. We're trying to build a coalition or a team there. So if you know anybody going to Boise, be part of a church plant team, we'd love to talk to you about that. The, uh, internationally, I was in Liberia in February of this year. The uh, ministry there is totally nationalized. They are doing everything themselves. This was the mission compound originally. There are a couple of our missionaries who are buried on this compound. George Call was a uh, pilot from Rock Church, the church I pastored, 
Dorothy Eastburn died there in 95. The last missionary to leave was Billy Call in about 2000. As uh, we were there, this is Kelvin uh, Sine, who is the overseer in Liberia. Church building behind him, uh, they've built this all with their money. The Liberians have done it. They have about 70% unemployment, but sacrificially they've gotten this far, trying to raise money for a roof. This is Pastor Nimley's church. You know, when I was there, he was standing on the uh, foundation. About three weeks later, they got the roof on it. Uh, pretty much all they need. Give me a roof, give me a, a, a little bit of a wall, and we'll have church. And they do it. And Pastor Josiah Swen, he has a, a Christian school with about 1,000 students. They have 190 in their nursing program, and right now they're building a hospital about seven miles away from their current location. They're going to be planning a church at the hospital, and, uh, and this is going to be a place for training their nurses, but they're also planting another church. The last uh, service that, or the, there we go, the last service we were at, oh, we can take this one too. Upper left, this will make you, uh, make you weep almost, but that's a dirt floor, a little piece of carpet, uh, tin roof. It's the building that's on the right, the lower right. We had to literally walk over a plank to get to this building. About 100 people on the Delta meet there. The pastor is a professor at one of the community colleges, just loves people, loves God. And the uh, same Jesus who's here this morning is right there. The bottom picture is probably one of the nicer sanctuaries. This is Josiah's sanctuary in Monrovia. The last Sunday we were there, this was the crowd finished up the conference. Over 300 uh, were at the conference all week. There were well over 600 for this meeting. The left side is the inside crowd. The right side is the outside crowd. And uh, we were able to ordain some folks and see the ministry continue. This is, uh, on the left is uh, Tony, Apostle Tony, who just is the new leader in the Ivory Coast. We've just now uh, launched SEA Ivory Coast. Emma Dan, Rich Conridge uh, from New York, and then uh, Success Samuel from Nigeria. He's the lead there. Uh, Bo Lee is pastoring Hope Hill Church in Manhattan. He was with me in, Liber in Nigeria last November. And uh, Bo's church right in the middle of Manhattan. I was with him the last Sunday of June. We walked out of the, the theater where church is being held right into the Gay Pride Parade. They are in the middle of where Jesus is desperately needed and doing a great job there. So the uh, uh, meetings were in the partially finished Bible school. Again, you get a windows and a, and a few doors and it'll be finished. But right now they just have a roof and walls and a floor. Uh, they, Johnny from Cameroon and others and are going on. I'll end with this one. was from Zambia. Mike Poole had gone with me uh, to... Nigeria and Zambia, and uh, one of the things in his heart was just calling people to missions and calling normal, everyday people. In 2012, we were in Nigeria, and we had a similar call to this, where we just said, are there some folks who God is stirring to missions? Because so many times in what we call mission fields, like Africa and other places, people are, have the mindset, well, the missionaries come to us. No, they need to be the missionaries who are going out. Jesus didn't call us to wait for somebody to make us disciples. He called us to go and make disciples. And so the African church needs to reach the Africans. And uh, they're beginning to do that. And, and so 2012, we had a similar call. About three people responded. 2014, we went back and found out all three of those had gone out and done something in missions. One of them, Brother Andrew, had gone from the south of Nigeria to the north, the Boko Haram area. Gone into a village with another guy, and they tried to build a school, had no money to speak of, mud blocks, got up the walls, the rains came, washed it down, discouraged, and getting ready to leave, and then the Boko Haram captured them and take them out into the jungle to execute them. And uh, he said, we were so far out in the jungle, we didn't know where we were, had no idea. We were far from the village, and as they're getting ready to take their lives, into that clearing stumbles a villager from the village where they'd been working. And when the villager stumbles in, he begins to plead for their lives. And he said, the clothes that I'm wearing, these men gave me. These are good men. Don't kill them. And they let him go. And so Brother Andrew, we see him now down in South Nigeria again. And he's getting ready to go back up and continue that mission. Why? Because his heart and his call is to reach the people with the call of Jesus Christ. So God's doing some great things. We're glad that we get to be a part of it, seeing partnerships developing literally around the world. Okay. Thank you so much, Pastor Dan, and uh, you did not do it this hour, so I get to do it. Uh, 
You guys are in the middle of talking about your mission and your work. And uh, when I asked, what do I share about and is there a theme? And Pastor Dan sent me this. It is the September uh, focus, and that is the mission. I declare I will take up my cross as a disciple of Jesus and work to make disciples of all peoples and nations. I declare the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me to do the ministry he's called me to. From Luke 9, 23, Isaiah 61, Acts 1, and Matthew 28. And you're all in, right? Amen. 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 All right. So we're going to Galatians today, and I get to take just a part of this. And I want to take uh, and steal everybody's thunder. No. Uh, <laughs> always... Uh, interesting when there are a few texts that we want to get to, although these are not the ones listed in the statement. I want you to go with me to Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, and I want to read just a couple of verses. I want to talk about the cross a little bit this morning, and uh, the cross is the universal symbol of Christianity without question. We have one here in the sanctuary. A lot of folks wear them as jewelry. Unfortunately, some of them end up using them as a good luck charm, hold up the cross, assume that if I've got a cross on, I'm safe or protected, that somehow there's something magical about the cross. But we're going to talk about the cross that's part of the mission and the cross of Christ and what He has done in our place and for us. Galatians 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, or by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And down to verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Then the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus died in our place. It was a great love that he had for us that caused him to do it. John's gospel, chapter 15, he says that this, greater love than this has no one than a man will lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus was willing to lay down his life not only for his friends, but for all of us who didn't know us, know him, some of us who didn't like him, some of us who didn't see a need for him, but Jesus was willing to do it. Now, the power of the gospel, the reality of the gospel is simply this, that the innocent died for the guilty. That's a very simple statement, but it's true. Jesus, in whom Pilate could find no fault. If anyone was motivated to find fault, it was Pilate. Because if he could have found some fault in Jesus, then he could have felt justified in crucifying him. But he said, I find no fault in him. There was nothing in him that should not have been in him. And so as Pilate is trying to find it, as any of us examine him, we don't find fault in Jesus, so we have to acknowledge that this is the one who came to be what is described in the Scripture as the Lamb of God who gives his life for the sins of the world. Jesus death on the cross. He came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. The law of the Gentiles, the law of humanity is serve me, take care of me, do something for me. In fact, the sad reality is even the law in the church is serve me. I'm going to join a church where I can get all my needs met. You know what the church really is? It's a place where you can meet other people's needs. Not a place where you go to look to get your own needs met, so it's a place where you go to meet other people's needs. What would happen if every Sunday morning, everybody in the room showed up to say, God, is there somebody that I can bless when I get there? I'll tell you what, we'd have a lot more fun in church, wouldn't we? We'd enjoy being together. Why? Because we'd have that adventure of sharing something good with somebody that we just got a chance to come prepared to minister to. 
Jesus had that kind of attitude. He went about doing good to everyone and for everyone. That was who he was and what he was. But when Jesus comes to the cross, and we need to understand the completeness of the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, and when he said, it is finished, it was finished. It was done. There was nothing more that needed to be done. There was no further sacrifice that was needed from anyone because Jesus was the perfect lamb and he satisfies the justice of God. He gives his life freely and willingly and his blood is sufficient to cleanse us from all sin, not some sin, not certain sins, but all sins cleansed because of what Jesus did. This morning we had the privilege of celebrating baptism with Isaiah and Ishmael. And as we celebrated their baptism, we were really seeing a demonstration externally of internal transformation. Baptism in what saves us, baptism is simply demonstrating what's already happened. You see, because once we have been saved or we have come to know Jesus Christ and we have been engaged with Him We demonstrate that in baptism. That's an act of obedience and a demonstration to the world of what Jesus has done. Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that as many of you were baptized, were baptized into Christ? Into Christ. It's the initiation and the identification right of the Christian church. Does both. Baptism has always been the initiation right of the church. Go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But it is also the identification with what Jesus has done. So when we buried Isaiah and Ishmael and put them under the water, we are saying the old nature has been put under. And unfortunately, in a lot of churches, that's where we stop. There's this whole list of things now you're not supposed to do anymore because you're a believer. We get the whole list of don'ts, we get all those things, and we forget that the other half of the equation is we are to be brought out of the water to walk in newness of life. We live in Him. We are to walk in the newness of the life that's given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we understand this, here's a couple of things that happen. First of all, we are dead to sin. Dead to sin. Uh, I, I tell everybody that I, I baptize over the years, I, I usually share this passage with them, Romans chapter 6, and I'd say this, I said, I wish I could tell you that from now on you will never struggle with sin again, or you'll never sin again, but I'd be lying. We have those struggles, those things come, but legally and positionally, they no longer own us. We were slaves of sin, but we buried that old slave, and we brought out a new one who is a slave to righteousness. We buried the old to bring out the new. We now are servants of Him, and we are slaves of righteousness. Therefore, reckon yourselves indeed to be dead unto sin, but alive to God. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as having been completely cleansed, completely forgiven, and completely washed because the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cleanse us from all sin? That's what he's called us to do, to see that. And tragically for many believers, we miss that fact that he does cleanse us, wash us, and forgive us completely. The power of sin broken because of the cross of Christ. Now, let me move on, and, and I, I, I get to go to Mark 4 for, or 8 for just a little bit. I'll try to be careful that I don't steal everything. You know, there are some things that uh, we need to hear again and again. I love the story about the preacher went to a new congregation and got up and preached the first sermon. and Everybody thought, oh, that was a great sermon. Next week, he got up, preached the identical sermon. 
they're scratching their heads a little bit. Do you only know one sermon? Third week, same thing. About the fourth or fifth week after preaching exactly the same sermon, some of the deacons came and said, do you study during the week? Are there any other sermons? <laughs> and and, and he, he responded, he said, you know, here's how it is. When you start doing what I'm talking about in this sermon, I'll move on to the next one. <laughs> There are some things we may need to hear again and again, huh? There are some things that don't get old. We just got to keep, keep with them. And here's, this is definitely one of those. Paul said, I die daily. So there are some things we've got to process regularly, and the cross is one of those things. The cross is one of those things because if we neglect the preciousness of the cross of Christ and the power of the blood of Christ and the work of Jesus on the cross, if we lose sight of that, we've lost sight of the very core of our being and who we are in Him. We lose our identity. But if we lose the cross that we are called to pick up, we'll become self-centered, selfish, and useless to the kingdom of God. So here we go. If anyone, Jesus is talking here, Whoever desires, Matthew, or Mark 8, 34, whoever desires, no, it says desires, it's good to have desires. Desire good things. Whoever desires to come after me. It's a proper desire. It's a good desire. It's a joining in the purpose of the life of Christ. It is whoever desires to come after me. If you want to follow Jesus, if you have that desire. And let me clarify here. Jesus said, whoever desires to come after me. He doesn't say whoever desires to be a member of Sunrise Christian Center. He doesn't say whoever desires to become one of my chosen ones. He said, whoever desires if there is something in you that is calling out for a relationship with God, if that is the desire of your heart, then we will find the solution to meeting that deep deeded desire within you. You see, God created you and me to have fellowship with Him. That was his intention in creation, that we, by an act of will and a choice of our own heart, would choose to honor him, would choose to love him, and would choose to worship him, not like marionettes on a string, but like people with an open, honest, willing choice to say, we will serve you. We will serve you. And every day, God would come down into the garden with Adam, and they would have conversation. There would be an intimacy of relationship. There would be a sharing and a going back and forth, and there would be that sharing of the day. You know, when I pruned off that tree over there, it was amazing how much bigger the fruit got. Yeah, that's how I created it to be. Vines need to be pruned. Adam went to the Adam didn't just sit around in the garden. It says he tended it. You know, sometimes we think, well, we can just sit around and all the blessings will come. No, no, no. He tended the garden. He was working. He was doing something. He was engaged in the activity of bearing fruitfulness. And as he's engaged in that process. He and God, I think, shared some secrets. How is it that you get more out of them? Do you take the third branch or the second branch? Which branch do you prune to get the most productivity? And God could tell him because he made it. And then he loses it. And when he loses it, God's looking for him and Adam is hiding in his shame and his sin and 
tries to cover himself instead of being vulnerable and open. So naked and unashamed. They were totally vulnerable. That's what nakedness is. It's totally vulnerable. They were totally vulnerable, and now they're ashamed. Do you think that God wants anything less than a naked and open relationship with us? One in which there is no shame, one in which we can be totally vulnerable, one in which we can be intimate with Him. That's what God longs for. That's what God's heart yearns for. And the only way it could happen is because of what Jesus did on the cross. But because Jesus did it, we can now enjoy it. That's what His delight is in us. But if we desire that, you have to deny yourself. Take up His cross and follow me. We are naturally selfish, and He calls us to selflessness. We naturally try to preserve ourselves. He calls us to lose ourselves. We naturally try to do it for us, and He calls us to do it for others. You see, we don't take up this cross that Jesus is talking about to add to what He did on the cross. His cross was to save us. Our cross is to serve Him. Let me say that a time or two because we need to see it. You see, the cross I take up is not for penance. The cross I take up is so that I can serve. Because it is only when I put myself to death that I'm able to be free to serve Him. Let me just shoot that that slide up. We just... This is not the cross that Jesus said to take up. You see, there are too many people who have the idea that somehow I've got to pay penance for my own sin, and somehow if I, if I am, it go through some kind of humiliation or flagellation or I do something painful or difficult, then somehow that's going to qualify me in a greater way to serve God, and it doesn't. Because nothing will get you closer to God than the blood of Jesus. That's the only option. There is nothing else that will do it. There's nothing else that can do it. And so we take up our cross not to be saved, but to serve the one who has already saved us. You see, we are working not for salvation. We're working from salvation. We're not working to get in. We're working because we're in. We're not working to get our names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're working because they are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're not working to try to somehow get His favor. We've already got His favor. We're not working to be His children. We already are His children. We're not working to get in. We're already in. And all we're doing is we are simply saying because we are in, we are going to do all we can to get others in. That's what your mission is. That we take up our cross and make disciples so that they too can enjoy what we have in Him. The apostle in our text said, I do not set aside the grace of God. I'm not going to go back to the law and all of its requirements to try to somehow get myself into a place that is pleasing to God because I'm already there. You've quoted it often. You've memorized it if you've ever done any evangelism. Sometimes we forget the following verse, though. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Aren't you glad that God has revealed himself to us? He chose to express himself in his word through the prophets and through the writers in his written word. He chose to express himself in the revelation of his spirit, and he mostly chose to reveal himself in the revelation of his son. So God has expressed himself to us, and the faith that we have is simply receiving what God has already showed us. And if you, if you haven't seen God, just go outside and take a look at a leaf, or tree, or an animal, and say, how did that just happen? It's because God said, let there be. Even creation, it says in Romans 1, teaches us that there's some kind of creator. Huh? That revelation. 
Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And we quote that because that is an essence of how we get to Christ. But then verse 10. Listen to what he says. For we are his workmanship. In other words, you and I are a demonstration of God's ability to craft something really cool. You have been created and crafted by the hand of God to be uniquely you, to be someone who can bring his good news to others who need to know him. So you are his workmanship. You are created in Christ Jesus. And how are you created? You're created for good works. You're created for good works. You're created to do good stuff. Because God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. God has made plans for you to do good things. You, we, we should be known as people who do good things. May Sunrise Christian Center be known as a place where good things are done and people are helped and blessed and encouraged. And may the community know that because of you, the place is better because you're here. This community benefits by your very existence here. They don't know it sometimes. They don't even recognize it sometimes. But if the salt and light were taken away, they'd know it because things would start getting darker. And things start getting more difficult around. And they say, what went wrong? Well, that church that used to be there isn't there anymore. Huh? See, we are called to do good works. And we are called to proclaim Christ. See, our purpose is the result of our position. And I've got to quickly wrap this thing up. Here's the question. Are we making disciples or are we making church members? See, the problem is we have a lot of places where we're making church members. Church members are people who know what to do, when to do it, and, and uh, how to do it. They know when to stand. They may even know when to raise their hands. They know the songs. They know what's expected of them. They got to show up at least two out of four weeks to be regular attenders. I'm telling the truth here. That's now the statistic. A regular attender in a church is considered somebody that makes it there two out of four. Or maybe in your case, you've got a higher standard. You've got to be here at least three. Maybe you've got to be here four to be regular. I don't know. But we, we know the rules, huh? And, and church members understand what they're supposed to do. And here's the problem. A lot of second and third generation kids know the rules. They know how to do church. They can put it on. They can sing the songs. They can play the instruments. They can maybe even preach a sermon. But if they've never been to the cross, they are just church members. And church members don't last. Church members are always looking for a better church. They're always looking for a place where they like the rules better, a place where they feel like they fit in better, a place where they, they like what's going on. Disciples, on the other hand, are transformers. Because disciples are multiplying themselves. Disciples are bringing more people to know the same Jesus that they know in the same intimacy that they have so that they can grow in the same grace that they know that they can multiply the kingdom of God, not just try to get another church member in. And here's where it gets significant, and maybe this perhaps defines the difference most clearly. John 15, I started there a little bit ago and quoted, greater love has no one who lays down his life for his friends. Then Jesus goes on to say, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And his command is very simple. It's just to love. And love, by my definition, is real simple. Seek the best for the other person. That's pretty simple. If I'm looking for the best for the other person, I'm loving them. Sometimes that means... I discipline them if they're my kid. Huh? What father is there that doesn't discipline his son? Sometimes we have to be corrected. That's love. But we do it for the benefit of the one who's being corrected, not for our own position or security. But Jesus goes on to say, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I've made known to you. 
The difference between a church member and a disciple is a church member knows what to do. A disciple knows why they do it. You see, the disciple comes to an understanding, I'm doing this not just because that's the way we do church. I'm doing this because we are honoring God. We are honoring one another. We are blessing our community, and we are seeking to bring others into an intimate relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. That's what he's calling us to do. You see, and, and the result of that, the result of that is this, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That's the result. We will bear fruit when we know we're friends of God who are connected to Him and we are beginning to multiply His kingdom. I, I got I to quit. I had another point. We'll do that another day. Maybe 1230, who knows? That's the beauty of going three services. You get to just keep going, you know. I could have actually just started where I left off last hour, but I, you, know, you would need to get some of this. But I need to give you one more thing. And I probably say this as much to John as anybody. So know the transition that you're in. And again, just... Uh, the stuff that the Lord just dropped in my heart early. An organization, and, and I would say this to all the leadership, to, to the church, because you're going through a transition. An organization begins to die when preservation becomes the mission and the founding mission is lost. Never forget that. The goal of the next chapter is not preservation. It's continuing on the foundation to add more rooms, to be a bigger house, to touch more people, to make more disciples so the kingdom of God can multiply. See, that's what God's called us to. He hasn't called us to just try to preserve something. And, and, and there's going to be change. You can be sure of it. When we go through generational changes, there are changes, but there are some things that are inviolate. And the mission of disciple-making can never be replaced with anything else, anytime, any way, because the mission is to bring the cross of Jesus Christ, the blood that He shed on that cross, for every person in this community and around the world, the mission is for us to be willing to say we will lay down whatever we need to lay down of our traditions, of our own self-interests, of our own desires, of our own intentions, of our own plans, of our own egos. We will lay that stuff down so that somehow as we take up the cross of service, we can advance the mission of making disciples until the day we see Jesus. Father, thank you for your word today. And Lord, I thank you for this great congregation. Father, I pray blessing upon them. I pray, Father, that you would bless their going out and their coming in. I pray that you'll bless their rising up and their sitting down. I pray that you will bless them in the community. I pray that you will increase the multiplication factor that they might see not just one church planted, but multiple churches planted. I pray, Father, that you will bless them with the resource to expand this campus to be able to, to move to another level. Father, we pray that you will do these things in the mighty name of Jesus. But Lord, in this moment of time, I would simply pray if there's anyone in the room today who has not come to know the blessedness of resting and trusting in what's been completed on the cross, may this be the day. May this be the moment of freedom from the guilt and the shame and the need to try to somehow work it out and do good enough. May this be the day we come to rest in you because you've done it all. It is finished. So we receive that and then we gladly 
serve you because of it. In Jesus' name.